Good evening. And welcome. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, the start of another year of intellectual challenge, of experiencing great literature, great film, great music, another year of meeting new friends and being introduced to new ideas. In other words, <laughs> welcome to another year of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Vanderbilt. It's a true delight to have you here tonight. We begin this evening by acknowledging the women and men who will be leading our fall term courses. There's not time tonight to give the impressive details of their careers or to say more than a brief word about each course, but fortunately, the uh, OLLI website and the fall term brochures, some copies are around, are readily available with all that data. I'm going to do these introductions of the courses and the people involved in the order in which the courses will be taught this fall, starting with Monday. Uh, I'll ask each lecturer who's here to stand as I give a short description of his or her course so that those of you who are still trying to decide which course to take We'll know whom to go to to ask those questions. This term, our Mondays start with the course, quote, The Transformations of Consciousness on Film, unquote. The course will be taught by a person with broad experience in cinema. Jeffrey Stein has been scriptwriter, director, producer on an impressive list of films. Many of you know him, I feel sure, through his work at the Watkins Institute here, or through his lectures and courses at Vanderbilt, at MTSU, at Tennessee State. <laughs> and as if all that were not enough to keep a person busy, he's also a novelist with several novels to his credit. Well, on Monday afternoon, Introduction to Islam, taught by Professor Howard Miller. The relevance of the course to current events is clear, but there's also fascinating history here. Dr. Miller is himself a specialist in the culture of Spain and Islam in the Middle Ages. Uh, maybe you can ask him about what he thinks about El Cid. No. That's a terrible idea. Why do I say things like that? Uh, he's taught at Cornell College in Iowa, at Pepperdine, and is currently serving as the chair of the Department of History, Politics, and Philosophy at David Lipscomb University. The next day, Tuesday morning, you'll be pleased to hear that Ed Young is returning to the temple to lead a course he calls The Joy of Opera. All of you who attended Ed's earlier courses know how extensive his collection of opera recordings is. He's also a collector of opera memorabilia, and he has made some remarkable donations from that collection to the Blair School, some of which have been displayed from time to time in the uh, display cases here. There will be classes filled with meaningful insights about the craft of opera, as well as wonderful excerpts from his wide-ranging collection. The second course on Tuesday is devoted to considering the poetry of George Herbert. We're very fortunate indeed to have Mark Jarman, Centennial Professor of English at Vanderbilt, to lead the course. Professor Jarman is a poet himself, whose published collections have drawn high praise from critics as well as prestigious awards. I'm wondering, just what will a person who's written poems about surfing have to say about the work of a metaphysical poet who was writing in the era just after Shakespeare and the King James Bible? I have no idea, but I know it's going to be fun. I feel sure of that. Wednesday morning, we begin with a, uh, <laughs> a feast, a course entitled, quote, Film, Fantasy, and Food, 
obviously a subject near to my heart, Spanish cuisine and culture. The lecturer is Clint Hendricks, who saw a variety of courses at Vanderbilt in recent years, as well as coordinating Intermediate Spanish 104, a course I suspect some of you took once upon a time. The course will concentrate largely on post-Civil War Spain. We'll gain a deeper understanding of that nation's culture through the study both of film and of food preparation. I have wondered, actually, whether we should have scheduled it second on Wednesday so it would come right before lunch, but how about Too late for that now. In fact, uh, the course just before lunch on uh, Wednesday will concentrate not on the taste buds, but on the brain. The course title is a little fanciful, perhaps, From Neurons to Perception, Insights into Brain Function and Dysfunction. I'm familiar with the latter. Uh, this is going to be a team talk course with a series of lecturers drawn from the Brain Institute at Vanderbilt. Each of the lecturers will talk about the cutting edge work being done in each of six different laboratories and what this work may mean for the treatment of brain disorders in the future. Moving to Thursday. On Thursdays, the 9.30 class will be, quote, exploring Antarctica. Far away the coldest of Earth's continents, and my former students will remember the only continent not to produce wine. <clears throat> uh, Antarctica fascinates explorers and scientists for many reasons. Not the least being the fact that it holds roughly 90% of the fresh water reserves of the, uh, of the entire planet. Our lecturer, Dan Morgan, is deeply interested in glaciers and particularly in the landscapes that glaciers leave behind when they retreat. Dr. Morgan has traveled the world from the Alps to the Rockies to the Himalayas doing his research. The past 10 years, he spent much of his time in Antarctica. <laughs> if you're like me, you may want to bring a sweater to wear during the slides uh, of that one. Second on Thursday morning, we have a course that was organized by Felicia Gates of our curriculum committee. She found the prospect of physical money being replaced by electronic bits and bytes both fascinating and perhaps a trifle frightening. She's recruited three experts to talk to us about Bitcoin, about that illicit marketplace known as the Silk Road, and its leaders, each known as Dread Pirate Roberts, and about other aspects of the changing nature of money. Two of the lecturers are associated with the Regional Organized Crime Information Center. Greg Thomas, uh, who we hope is going to be here. Thank you, sir. And Mark Zimmerman. Good to see you, sir. The third, Dr. Josette McLaughlin, is a faculty member at the Heller College of Business of Roosevelt University in Chicago. Our Friday morning class this semester carries a longish title, To Make a World, Exploring Self, Love, and Loss Through Spiritual Storytelling. Our leader in this project will be Cody Case. Many of you will remember uh, Cody for his course last year when he led us through a consideration of theories of the good life. For those of you who do not yet know him, Cody is an interfaith chaplain who is widely read and remembers a frightening amount of philosophy, history, psychology, and theology. You should also realize that if he were not a chaplain, he would make a great con man. <laughs> uh, he can draw you into his 
sometimes complex, sometimes confusing, often beautiful world before you know what's happened to you. Well, it'll be a marvelous journey again, I feel sure. It is with considerable regret that I must tell you that our other planned Friday morning offering has been canceled. That course, dealing with tax reform proposals, was to have been taught by my predecessor as president of this institution, Don Bishop. Don, unfortunately, has recently had two strokes, and they will prevent him from, his, from presenting the course. The most recent information we have is that he is doing very well indeed, but this is not the time to put additional stress and strain on his system. In this recital of our offerings, I should not forget our special offerings. As usual, the writing course taught by Victor Judge, Assistant Dean of the Vanderbilt Divinity School, filled instantly. Those who had to be turned away will be hearing from us about a similar opportunity soon. Your fall brochure tells you also about the CEE groups. The letters stand for Connect, Expand, Explore. They're easy to join, easy to leave. They merit your thought. There's one other special offering to mention, but I'm going to postpone that for a few minutes. So thank you to all these who are going to offer our fall courses. For those who are here, let us express our thanks. Let me turn now to a different group to whom I feel most especially grateful. A project like OLLI at Vanderbilt relies very heavily on the work of volunteers. I want to spend a moment to recognize the particular contributions of a few. First, let me mention the work of the Special Events Committee, chaired by Claire Schutte. Their next offering is a trip to Lynchburg and Bell Buckle on October the 2nd. You may have seen sign-up forms outside. If you have not seen it, pick one up. Sign-up is still possible. You know, no one, absolutely no one, has ever lost weight eating lunch at Miss Bobo's. Uh, <laughs> don't miss the, 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 the opportunity. I, I've heard there's another interesting business in Lynchburg as well, but I wouldn't know about that. Uh, sign up tonight. Second, there are the folk who plan our Lunch and Learn series. That committee this year is chaired by Stephen Grile. The 2014-2015 theme is Know Your City, which we're carrying forward this evening. Your city is not necessarily the same Nashville as the one we see on Channel 2 on Wednesdays. And we will learn about the real Nashville in a series of lectures. In October, the speaker will be Rick Bernhardt of Nashville Next. In November, they're going to bring us Tom Turner, who is president of the Nashville Downtown Partnership. Third, arguably the hardest working group of all, we have the Curriculum Committee, chaired by Paul Gurman for a fourth year. Clutton for punishment, Paul. These are the people who seek out lecturers, review course proposals, try to provide balance in the range of courses we offer each year. What a splendid job they've done for this fall. You just heard, hold your hats, wait for winter and spring. Fourth, our thanks need to go to the members of our board of directors who meet quarterly to keep track of the work of all the committees to make suggestions about the future direction of our program and who provide general oversight for all that we do. To all of these, my thanks, and I'm sure on your behalf, your thanks as well. If there are members of the board or of any of these three committees here, please stand and let us say thank you. All that volunteer work by the members of 
OLI at Vanderbilt would not result in the programs we experience were it not for the work of our professional staff. It simply would not be possible for rotating volunteers to book lecture sites, produce brochures and newsletters, find caterers and shuttles, follow up on the phone with lecturers to make sure they remember when their courses are scheduled, and so on. It takes continuity to maintain institutional memory. About just which lecturers, for example, said they couldn't teach in 2013, but what about 2014 or 15? Let me acknowledge three of those who are responsible for keeping us coordinated despite our best efforts to fly off in different directions. First, there's Gail Williams, Associate Director for Community Engagement in the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations. Not only does Gail oversee the office, which provides us with support and coordination, she also recruited one of our favorite <clears throat> lunch and learn lecturers, her husband David, who had the temple absolutely rocking to the beat of Motown music. Uh, she's a wonderful person. Dottie Rager's official title is Program Coordinator. That does not begin to describe what she does. Producing newsletters, remembering where the extra adapter is to let Apple PowerPoints talk to Microsoft governed projectors and so on. I thought maybe outreach and troubleshooting officer would, would be a better designation. And then of course, there is Norma Clifford, our director. Our program would simply fall apart without Norma. Whatever the problem, it seems to have happened at least once before and she remembers the cure. Don Bishop, my predecessor, uh, despite being one of the most organized people in the world, forgot to bring to the meeting where I was taking over the office the four-inch thick president's handbook that explains in excruciating detail how one is supposed to do things. Bob, he said, it really doesn't matter. Just do what Norma tells you. <laughs> Everything will be all right. Let us thank these three wonderful people. A few minutes ago, I said I was delaying one introduction. Actually, it's a pair of introductions. Last year, for the first time at this event, we heard from the OLLI Steel Drum Band. The director of the group, most of whom <laughs> had never touched a steel drum before, is Matt Britton. Matt has literally traveled the globe teaching drumming, steel drumming in particular. He's equally at home in recording studios with personalities like Kenny Chesney and Rebecca Lynn Howard or on the waterfront on the island of Trinidad, or in special presentations like the Panorama uh, contests and presentations at uh, the Virginia festivals. His students at Blair and elsewhere carry on a great tradition. Matt's been joined this year by an assistant, Allison Havlick. Allie graduated from Vanderbilt's Blair School, where we are tonight, in 2013. While a student here, she was selected to travel to China. She taught a week-long music camp as part of a collaboration between our two countries. She's stayed on now in Nashville, where she freelances in various musical and educational settings, including Matt's uh, Deep Grooves Steel Band. She arranges music for and is the assistant director of the Vanderbilt Steel Band program and is the newly appointed director of the Osher Advanced Level Steel Band. So, let us hear from Matt Alley and the Osher Vanderbilt Steel Drum Band.
Sundays, uh, and if you are interested, <clears throat> there was, the last time I checked with Norma, still a space available. Uh, so if you would love to make that kind of sound, let us know. In the meantime, Matt, uh, how on earth did you get started with steel drums in Kansas? Well, I went to Wichita State University, and the school bought some steel drums. I just fell in love with the sound, and then learned more about the culture, traveled to Trinidad, and just fell in love with it, and now I'm lucky enough to teach it here. Well, it's a great, great program for our members, and we thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. In the... Uh, Winter of 1977-78, I did Nashville a couple of favors without quite knowing how big they were. As uh, many of you know, I taught at the Vanderbilt Law School for 46 years. During roughly half, actually a little more than half of those years, I served on the admissions committee. 77-78 was one of those years. By 77, the choices had become increasingly tough. When I was first on the admissions committee in the early 1960s, we by and large simply tried to weed out applicants who probably could not make it, given their past grades and writing skills and LSAT scores. By 1970, we reached the point at which most of those we were rejecting probably could make it through. We were beginning to sort out the strongest from the strong. That's a tough set of choices to make, and there were a good many cases where committee members would differ about whether a given applicant should be in rank group one, for sure, rank group two, maybe, or rank group three, waiting list at best. Among the files that year were two very different candidates. One was a Yankee, yes. attending Columbia University in New York. The other was a person with strong local ties studying at a relatively small college in the Midwest, Denison University. For whatever reasons, I and my colleagues decided that both these applicants should be admitted, both accepted our offers of admission, both came, and with the help of a few afternoons at Blackacre, the two became very fast friends. In fact, the very best of friends. They married. The one with local ties somehow managed to encourage the other to think that staying on in Nashville instead of going back east might make sense. And both have contributed in very meaningful ways to this community. One, Ann Davis, is now the managing attorney of the Southern Environmental Law Center in Nashville. The other is our speaker for the evening. It is a very great pleasure indeed to introduce a former student, a strong supporter of public education, a tireless promoter of our city, and husband, the mayor of Metropolitan Nashville, the Honorable Carl Dean. Thank you, and thank you, Bob, for that uh, very special introduction. I was getting a little nervous because I thought when you were describing the admitted maybe pile and the waiting list pile, Anne was clearly going to go in the admitted pile, and I wasn't so certain where, where I was going to end up. Uh, but I'm, I'm lucky that um, I got into the Vanderbilt and started here in 1978 because it's meant the world to me. Um, you know, today is actually a great day for Vanderbilt. Um, the uh, new U.S. News and World Report rankings came out, and uh, I don't know how serious everybody takes those things, but I always read them with interest. 
And Vanderbilt, as a university, ranked the highest it's ever been um, and, and, and did very, very well. But Vanderbilt in my life was absolutely key. I came down here in 78 um, sight unseen to Nashville. I grew up in a small town in New England and went to college in New York City and, and thought that I'd spend the rest of my life in New England, so I wanted to go see a different part of the country, so I applied to Vanderbilt and got in. Uh, I came down here, started school, and I liked Nashville a lot. Uh, met a woman, as Bob made reference to, who was a Nashville native. She was in law school with me, and she was a whole lot smarter than me, did a whole lot better in law school than me. Um, but, you know, we fell in love, and we did, um, you know, we had what diplomats would call frank and open discussions about where we'd live after we got married. I was arguing for small town, industrial, um, un unemployment, uh, racked in New England, and she was arguing for vibrant, growing Nashville. And um, I, I live in Nashville. It was uh, the first of many failures I've had as an advocate, but it was the best thing that could ever happen to us because it's been such a great city to live in. And one of the things I think that makes Nashville great, and I, I don't talk about it enough, but I'll say it here at the very beginning, is just the importance of universities. Uh, Vanderbilt obviously holds a, a, a big part of my heart, but um, whether it's Belmont and Lipscomb or TSU or Fisk, uh, universities are absolutely key to the city's uh, economic vibrancy. Uh, having been mayor through the Great Recession, um, I know that when other things were, were closing down or slowing down, the universities kept going. They kept going not only with employing a lot of people, they kept going by bringing in people to the city. And I've always been thankful for that. And, and you look around this campus, you look around Lipscomb, Belmont, and you see all sorts of construction happening, all sorts of investments in our city, and it makes you feel good. I've had um, the fortune of being mayor uh, for seven years now. I have one year left, a little bit over a year uh, on my final term. I cannot run for re-election. And it's been really interesting. It's been a great job. Because it's a great city, and I think the work is important, and you feel like you're actually doing something. But I had the experience of going through the first term where you know, I was elected in 07, late 07, and I took office, and then in um, 08, unrelated to my election, let me stress this, the country went into the deepest recession it has known since the Great Depression, which changed everything that we, you know, did. Um, I, we had to make lots of cuts in, in budgets. We cut most departments, including my own, between 10 and 15 percent. We eliminated positions of about 670. Um, but we may remain true to our priorities, which were public education, public safety, and economic development. And then uh, the flood uh, happened in May 2010 in my first term, which was, of course, the greatest natural disaster we've had here probably in 75 years. Eleven of our citizens died. There was $2 billion worth of damage to public property, to private property, and about half a, half a billion to the public property. But the city came back strong. Uh, and the story of the flood is the people in Nashville, the way they volunteered, the way they stepped up, the way they didn't get down, and way, the way the city recovered. So that was my first term. And then reelected in 2011, and I've had the great fortune to be mayor during this time when uh, Nashville has gotten all sorts of national attention. Whether it's being ranked or called the it city by the New York Times, and um, I do get up every morning and go to the end of my driveway and get the times and make sure no one else has been called the it city since. We still, we're still the it city. I don't know what it means, but it's a good, it's a good thing. Uh, you know, the Time Magazine calls us the red hot city of the south. You have uh, all sorts of Forbes and Bloomberg and, and travel and leisure with these rankings that are really, I think, designed for mayors to have something to brag about. Nashville has done very, very well because of the entrepreneurial economy, because of the the diversity of the city and the strength of the city, we've done well. But you don't have to look at those type of magazine rankings. You can look at things as concrete as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which tell us that in 2012, Nashville had uh, the greater, the Nashville region had the highest percentage job growth of any area of the United States in 2012, number one. In 2013, we were number two. And in 2014, we're going to do well. I'm not sure exactly where, but we're going we're to do well. Uh, the Bureau of Census tells us about four or five months ago that of the 50 major metropolitan areas in the United States, we're the seventh fastest growing. Uh, so there's a lot happening here. 
And I, I look at um, the reason for that, and I, there's, there's a lot of different things. First, I think is there's a diversity of the economy. I've touched on universities, but we have health care, which is vitally important to the city. Um, health care is the number one uh, private sector of employment for Nashville. It's an incredibly entrepreneurial sector. If you look at the HCA family tree, the company spawned off from HCA by entrepreneurs. There's like 200 of them. And, and that just continues to grow and grow. Um, hospitality is enormous. About 55,000 people are employed in hospitality and music here. And then music is so special because it gives us that edge, that creative edge that other cities would die for. To be a city that attracts creative people. I, I bet you every Thursday morning after watching the show Nashville on ABC, people wake up and say, I'm going to go to Nashville and be a songwriter. I'm going to go to Nashville and be a star. I'm going to go to Nashville and do the lights for concerts. We attract creative people um, as much as any city in America, and the intensity of the, music si of the music industry in Nashville is greater than any city in North America, uh, which is a wonderful thing to have here. Um, we have also worked and stressed the fact that Nashville needs to be a safe city, and I'm very proud of um, our police department and fire department. Our police department has done outstanding work. Uh, one of the things that um, I spent uh, most of my uh, adult life working uh, in the criminal justice system, not as a defendant, but as a lawyer. Um, and in the, the criminal justice system, I remember very well when I was public defender back in the 1990s, the late 1990s, the average homicide rate in Nashville was somewhere between 90 and 110. Um, in 2013, we had uh, somewhere around 44 homicides in Nashville. To find another year where you had that number or lower, you would have to go back 50 years to the founding of the metropolitan government when the city was a couple hundred thousand people smaller. So that's an incredible accomplishment of the police department. Um, and, and crime has steadily gone down. We've invested a lot in police. I think since I've been mayor, we've hired somewhere over 660 police officers. We've kept a recruitment a recruit class going constantly. We have a great, um, a great academy. Uh, we've invested in new precincts. We just opened a precinct over um, on 8th Avenue in the Wedgwood area, the, the uh, Midtown Hills, it's called, that services Vanderbilt, Belmont, and Lipscomb. And by opening that new precinct, it reduces the coverage of other precincts. We've opened a new precinct in Madison, too, with our own crime lab. We're the only city, one of the few cities in the country that can do our own DNA testing. Uh, and we built new precincts on wet, uh, over on Charlotte, and we built a new precinct downtown. Uh, we have excellent leadership in the department. You know, I'm sure you all watched what was going on in Missouri for the last few weeks with concern. And you probably asked yourselves, what would happen if that happened in Nashville? Well, I hope it wouldn't have happened in Nashville. But if something like that did, um, I think what happened in, in Ferguson didn't happen overnight. It happened from neglect of a lot of important issues for a long time. But here, our police department is constantly working with the community. They're constantly reaching out to clergy. They're constantly going to community meetings. And um, they've done just an extraordinary job. And finally, I think the biggest area for the city to work on is education. Um, it's been what I've worked on, I think, the most since I've been mayor. We've put a, a lot of money in it. We'll continue to put money into it. Um, I think we've made progress. Uh, I, I know that uh, graduation rates are up. I know that attendance is up. I know that um, uh, the number of students who are in our public school system has increased. And test scores have gone up, but not enough. But this to give you a sense of what the issue is, ACT tests, which I didn't have to take when I was applying to college, but those are the tests you take to show college readiness. Tennessee as a state ranks 44th in the country. Nashville ranks below the state. Right, so if we want to be everything we can be as a city, we need to improve that. We need to improve it dramatically. I'm a big believer that the cities that are really going to do well the next uh, 20 years, 30 years, are going to be the cities that produce and attract the most college graduates and the cities that attract and produce the most creative people. And that's what we need to set about doing. Uh, and that will remain a challenge for, for the city going forward, for, I think, for, for some years to come. But that is the most important work we possibly can do. Other areas that I think uh, that are important, um, uh, transportation, uh, you probably know, is a big issue that I think is vitally important for our city. As I mentioned, Nashville is growing. 
We are the seventh fastest growing major city in America and the Nashville region, the greater Nashville region, will grow by one million people at a minimum between now and 2035. So to, it, to, to, to picture that, that means that Nashville will be the same size of the Denver region is now. If you've been to Denver, you know what they've done with transportation, you know how much they've prepared for their future. The cities that we compete with most directly, I'd say, are Charlotte, Austin. Um, both are a decade ahead of us when it comes to transit. The growth is coming. It's coming because people want to be here. They want to be here for a lot of good reasons. Um, and, and, the, and we just have to prepare ourselves for it. I do have this um, sense that Nashville is a city of the future. I do have the sense that I've been fortunate to be here for over 30 years. I can tell you without any reservation, this is a better place now than it was in 1978 because of the people here. I think the city is more diverse, it's more interesting. I also believe very strongly that uh, this is going to be a better city five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And I don't think there are many mayors who can say that. And I can say it without any hesitation. Um, so it's been a real honor being mayor. Thank you for giving me these moments to talk to you about this city that we all love. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Well, as we've said before, this year's Lunch and Learn series is going to be about this marvelous city. Now, there's only one thing standing between you and the marvelous spread outside. Me. That's dangerous. We are adjourned.